The student went for an interview and disappeared without a trace. The next morning her body was found in a field and the police began searching for those responsible. From the first days of the investigation, there were many confusing moments and unexpected twists. But in the end, the truth was revealed. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Megan Sharpton. Megan Sharpton was born on October 24, 1987, in the small American town of Tullahoma, Tennessee. She grew up in a large and friendly family, with two sisters and a brother with whom she got along very well. Her parents tried to give maximum attention to all their children, but Megan was closest to her mother. From an early age, the young woman helped her parents take care of her younger siblings. She also always tried to help her friends and loved ones. In her school years, Megan decided she wanted to become a nurse. So she enrolled in the local Motlow College, which was 10 kilometers from her home. The young woman also got a job as a waitress in a local restaurant and eventually moved in with her boyfriend, Chris. In the summer of 2012, when Megan was 24 years old, she had only a few months left before finishing college. After that, she planned to immediately find a job as a nurse. Shortly before this, she also got a job at a nursing home to gain practical skills in helping the elderly. Despite such an intense rhythm of life, Megan tried to see her family whenever possible. On July 1st, her sister, who lived in another city, came home and Megan promised to meet with her. However, that evening, the young woman called her mother and said that she would be delayed. She was offered an interesting job opportunity, and Megan agreed to an interview that same evening. She was happy for this opportunity and promised her mother to come as soon as the interview was over. According to her, the job involved taking care of an elderly woman. However, time passed and there was no news for Megan. She did not respond to messages or calls. Her parents began to worry. They contacted her boyfriend. But he also did not know where Megan was and was not even aware of the interview. Despite this, the parents decided not to panic and wait for their daughter to get in touch. She was already 24 years old and with her busy schedule, between studying and two jobs, the young woman could simply be busy. But the next day, Megan still did not show up. Meanwhile, in a remote area several kilometers from the city, at around 1.30 a.m., a group of teenagers noticed a fire in a field. It was a hot summer, so they thought that the forest fires had spread to the grass. They immediately called the firefighters who arrived at the scene. However, an unexpected turn of events awaited them. Soon after the firefighters began extinguishing the flames, they saw a body laying in the center of the fire. When the fire was completely extinguished and the police arrived at the scene, the they realized that a dead young woman lay before them. They immediately understood that a murder had been committed. However, the detectives could not establish the identity of the deceased. She had no documents, wallet, or phone with her, and due to the fire's effects, she could not be identified. The only thing that the detectives could grasp was two small star-shaped tattoos. The detectives studied the crime scene and concluded that the young woman was already dead before the fire started. This was evidenced by a serious head injury, which apparently was fatal, but they could not find any traces of the killer's presence. The victim was partially undressed, but from her t-shirt the police concluded that she worked as a nurse. They also determined that they had not received any reports of missing persons related to this young woman. Which also complicated establishing her identity. However, soon after the information spread throughout the small town, her mother saw a post on social media about a young woman with two star-shaped tattoos being found in the field at night and realized with horror that her daughter was the victim. Medical experts ultimately confirmed that she was indeed Megan Sharpton. They also found that the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the back of the head, confirming the police version that the young woman was already dead at the time of the fire. Moreover, she was killed in another location and then taken to that field. In addition, she was subjected to violence before her death, and the experts were able to extract a DNA sample from the perpetrator. It was immediately run through the database. There were no matches. First, the detectives began searching for Megan's car, a red Mustang. She had been working at a restaurant that evening and left in her car, but it was nowhere to be found. This indicated that the killer most likely drove it somewhere where they could find substantial evidence. 
However, its location remained unknown and the police started searching for potential suspects among Megan's acquaintances. Their first focus was on her boyfriend, Chris, and the detectives had a significant reason to investigate him. Megan's sister immediately told them that she suspected Chris's involvement in the murder because there had been problems in their relationship. Megan had been dating Chris for three years, some of which they had lived together. They shared an apartment with another roommate and the police spoke with Chris, who denied any involvement in the crime. At first, he claimed that everything was fine between him and Megan, but eventually admitted that their relationship had been struggling lately and they were heading for a breakup. He insisted, however, that he had no motive for the murder and had a solid alibi at the time of her death. While the police checked his alibi, they decided to search the apartment where Megan and Chris lived. In the bathroom, they found the first alarming clue. Blood stains and needles containing illegal substances. At the same time, 20 kilometers outside the city, detectives found her car. It had been abandoned in a remote, deserted location. Inside there were no documents or phones, which meant that the perpetrator might have taken or thrown them away elsewhere. The police reached out to the public, asking people to report anything similar they might find. Additionally, there was no signs of struggle or blood in the car, but they found something interesting. A note with an address that didn't exist. The detectives concluded that the unknown criminal had used this address to lure Megan to a deserted place to commit the crime. From the first hours of the investigation, detectives learned that the evening of the crime, Megan was supposed to go for an interview. But they had absolutely no leads in that direction. They believed that the non-existent address was given to her by the person who offered her the job. When the public learned the details of the case, many drew a chilling parallel. Six months ago, another young woman of roughly the same age as Megan, who was also studying to become a nurse, disappeared without a trace several hundred kilometers from Tahoma. What was even more terrifying was that this coincidence led everyone to believe that a serial killer was at work in the area, fueling the atmosphere of fear that the perpetrator would strike again. Meanwhile, the police questioned the couple's neighbor, who admitted to taking illegal substances. The neighbor claimed that Megan and Chris did not know about this and never indulged in it themselves. That they did indeed belong to the neighbor, but his story didn't end there. He claimed that Megan and Chris had actually broken up a long time ago, and he had started seeing her recently. The neighbor also insisted that he had been hiding his addiction from her. With this information, the police began to suspect both Chris and the neighbor. Chris could have held a grudge against Megan, and the neighbor had a penchant for illegal substances. There was no evidence against them. During his interrogation, Chris stated that he didn't know about the relationship, and by that time, the police had already verified his alibi. At the time of Megan's murder, he was indeed at work, so they ruled him out as a suspect. As for the neighbor, he didn't have a solid alibi, but analyzing his phone records revealed that he had been trying to call and message Megan all night. In an attempt to find out where she had gone. Although this was not substantial evidence of his innocence, the police doubted that he was the killer. Both of the guys had their DNA samples taken and sent to the lab, but the results could take months to come back. Meanwhile the detectives had a new lead. Chris had offered to help with the investigation during his last interrogation which was at home and said he wanted to talk to her about a caregiver job and that Naomi had recommended her. Chris added that Megan had mentioned a young woman with that name who went to college with her, but he didn't know any details. So the police started looking for her among Matlow's students and soon found her. She was the only student with that name and the detectives got her address, but she wasn't home. They talked to her neighbors and one of them gave them Naomi's phone number. She was surprised by the police call and said she barely knew Megan. They had a few classes together but didn't talk much and she never recommended her for a job. In fact, she added that Megan annoyed her so she wouldn't have helped her. The police were disappointed that this promising lead didn't lead anywhere, but they still had something more substantial. Chris gave them the phone on which the job call had come in, and the detectives had the caller's number. Experts determined that the call was made from a prepaid phone, so it was impossible to identify the owner's name. But the police traced the device to the store where it was sold, and there was a surveillance camera at the checkout. By studying the footage on the day of the phone purchase, they immediately saw the buyer. 
From these shots, the police immediately realized that he was buying the phone for some illegal purposes. Prepaid phones in America are in demand among those involved in criminal cases as they do not need to provide their data to use them. And this person on the recording at some point took out his own phone from his pocket indicating that he was buying an additional one for some questionable purposes. There was also a camera in the store pointing at the parking lot. The police saw the buyer leave the building and get into his car, which soon led to the identification of his identity. It turned out to be Timothy Gifford who had an impressive criminal history. However, the man only engaged in petty trade of illegal substances and was not involved in anything serious. He was soon tracked down and taken to the police station. He claimed that he had purchased the phone not for himself, but for his acquaintance. A 37-year-old man named Donnie Jones. He said that Donnie was going to have an operation and he himself would not be able to go for the phone. As payment for this service, Donnie gave Timothy several illegal pills. Detectives were familiar with this man. He also had an impressive criminal history, but often acted as a police informant. Until Timothy revealed something else. Donnie wrote to him that he wanted to exchange his pickup truck for a Mustang and ask for help with this. Timothy considered this request quite strange as Donnie had two small children and the Mustang was far from the most convenient family car. However, he agreed to try to find a client. Donnie handed him the pickup truck and he noticed that there was brand new carpets and seat covers in the interior of the rather old car. Donnie explained this by saying that his wife had told him that the chances of selling the car with a refreshed interior were much higher, and here the police suddenly discovered something that shocked them and glued all these parts to the store together. Donnie Frank turned out to be the husband of Naomi, who supposedly recommended the job to Megan. At this point, the detectives realized that they were getting close to solving the case. Unfortunately for them, the man's DNA sample was not in the database as he had not been charged with violent crimes. They immediately went to Donnie and Naomi's house to talk to them. At first, the man claimed that he was not familiar with Megan, but within a few minutes he said that he had given her and Naomi a ride to college a few times. This seemed strange against the backdrop of Naomi's testimony a few weeks earlier. Then she claimed that she barely knew Megan and they hardly spoke and did not get along in general. However, during the subsequent conversation, the woman did say that her husband had indeed given them a ride once. However, Donnie firmly insisted on his innocence. According to his words, on the evening of the murder, he was at home with his children. He allowed the police to search his house without a warrant and voluntarily provided his DNA sample. In addition, he denied asking Timothy to buy a prepaid phone for him. The police found no evidence in his house and they had to wait for the DNA test results, which could also take months. Two months had passed since the murder. People hoped that the police would catch the ruthless monster who could kill someone else at any moment. Eventually the lab results showed a complete match between Donnie's DNA sample and the one found in Megan's body. He was immediately brought to the station, but he continued to insist on his innocence. Upon learning about the DNA match, he changed his story and told the detectives that he had a secret affair with Megan, which he did not tell his wife about. This was supposedly the reason why he did not reveal this information initially. The police considered his story an obvious fabrication, but they had to release him. Besides DNA, they had no other connecting evidence, and finding a 100% refutation of Donnie's words was simply impossible. Thus, the detectives were almost certain that Donnie was the killer, but they needed more evidence. Although they could not charge him with murder, they still managed to arrest him. During a search of his car, they found a firearm that he was not allowed to possess due to his criminal record. While he was in custody, the police had time to search for additional evidence. They did not have to worry about Donnie attacking someone else or running away. Soon, experts determined that Megan was shot with a firearm of the same caliber as Donnie's rifle. Detectives obtained a warrant to track his phone to see his movements on the evening of Megan's murder. They compared this data with the movements of the prepaid phone that Donnie allegedly never owned, and here the police waited for a long-awaited breakthrough. On the evening of July 1st, the prepaid phone was next to Donnie's phone and was moving along the same route. Detectives identified several key locations. Megan's presumed abduction site, the location where she was killed, and the field where her body was found. 
Both phones were found together at all these points. Donnie's family owned several farms in the Tullahoma area, and according to the investigation, he brought Megan to one of them after kidnapping her, where he assaulted and killed her. Detectives obtained a search warrant and found a significant piece of evidence. A partially burned scarf that belonged to Megan, which was a gift from her sister. This evidence, combined with Megan's belongings and DNA found at the scene, was sufficient to send the case to trial. On November 5th, Donnie was charged with murder. During the trial, new details emerged that only strengthened the case against Donnie. Experts examined his phone and discovered that he had repeatedly contacted other young offering them jobs as caretakers for elderly people. But all of these attempts were unsuccessful. According to the investigation, Donnie found Megan's phone number on his wife's contact list, contacted her and said that Naomi had recommended her for the caretaking job. She agreed and he gave her a fake address, luring her to a remote location. There he attacked her, took her to the farm, where he assaulted and killed her. He then took her body to a field and set it on fire. The final touch was a complete replacement of the floor mats and seat covers in his pickup truck, which he used to transport her body. Apparently, he was afraid that some blood stains might be difficult to clean and the police would be able to detect them. As for Naomi, the police concluded that she had nothing to do with the murder and had no knowledge of it. She was at work that night, which was confirmed by numerous pieces of evidence. During the trial, Donnie claimed his innocence and everyone was preparing for a potentially lengthy process. However, when he realized that the prosecution was seeking the death penalty, he decided to make a deal with the investigation. He would admit guilt in exchange for avoiding the death penalty. He pleaded guilty to the murder of Megan and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. However, he later claimed that he had only made the deal under pressure and demanded a retrial. When the judge granted his request, the man quickly returned to his original decision to plead guilty as the death penalty was back on the table during the retrial. During the court proceedings, it was also explained why the criminal voluntarily provided detectives with his DNA sample, without any doubt. Apparently, he hoped that the fire would destroy all traces and the police would simply have nothing to compare a sample to. But he was wrong. Despite this, investigators concluded that Donnie was highly unlikely to be involved in the disappearance of another student who disappeared six months before Megan. More suitable suspects appeared in that case, and Donnie's candidacy was no longer considered. After the verdict was announced, Megan's sister stated that the criminal would have continued to hunt young women and could have taken many more lives, but Megan stopped him with her own life. And finally, what makes this story even sadder is that in November 2013, Megan's mother, who had been doing everything in her power to help the police catch her daughter's killer, passed away. She cannot cope with the devastating trauma inflicted on her by one cold-blooded criminal. Looking at Donnie's biography, it becomes clear that he could have been stopped much earlier. Among his many convictions was the charge of kidnapping a young woman, but that time he managed to escape punishment and the criminal remained free. Who knows, maybe Megan wasn't his first victim, but the police still don't know about it. Share your thoughts on this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. A first-year college student was found dead in her own bedroom. Almost immediately, the police had several suspects, any one of whom could have been the killer. The subsequent events resembled a detective series with unexpected twists and a long-awaited truth obtained thanks to a tiny DNA sample. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Jennifer Holland. Jennifer Halland was born on February 23, 1988, in a small American village called Wimberley, Texas. She had loving parents, a sister named Diana, and a carefree, peaceful childhood. Soon her family moved to a city called Bryan, which was about 200 kilometers from her native village. After finishing school, the young woman entered a local college called Blinn College where she planned a study to become a legal assistant and hoped to connect her future life with jurisprudence. She had many friends who spoke of her as a kind, hardworking and friendly young woman. She always looked at life positively and looked forward to her future career. Jenna settled near her college, renting an apartment in Autumn Woods Apartments. She also got a job as a waitress in a local restaurant to cover her housing expenses and not rely on her parents financially. 
Despite a busy schedule in which she had to combine studying and working, Jenna often spent time with her boyfriend, Spencer Hood. They had been dating since high school but lived separately, even after Jenna moved into a rented apartment. Their relationship had been going on for several years, although the couple argued periodically. On April 8, 2008, Jenna, who was 20 years old at the time, finished her shift and, at around 9 p.m., headed home. Since Spencer studied with her at the same college and lived nearby, Jenna invited him over to help each other with their homework. At around midnight, Spencer said goodbye to Jenna and went home. About half an hour after that, they briefly talked on the phone. After which they wished each other good night and went to sleep. On the morning of April 9th, Spencer discovered that he had left his textbook at Jenna's place, which he needed for a lecture. Around 11.30 a.m., he went to her house to retrieve it. When no one answered the door, Spencer was surprised to find that it was unlocked. Thinking that Jenna was still asleep, he walked into her apartment and headed to her bedroom. However, he was met with a horrifying sight. Jenna was lying lifeless on the floor. Realizing that she was dead, Spencer immediately ran to the neighboring apartment and asked the residents to call the police. The recording of this call is publicly available. Jenna's neighbor informed the operator that she was lying on the floor not breathing and Spencer's shocked voice could be heard in the background. The arriving police officers examined the apartment and found no signs of forced entry. The only strange thing was that the window in the second bedroom was open. Detectives immediately speculated that the killer may have entered the premises through it, but this theory was questioned due to the unlocked door. Investigators immediately doubted the theory of a possible robbery, which could have led the perpetrator to attack Jenna. As all her things were in their place, nothing valuable was missing, and her purse with money and credit cards was hanging right by the front door, which a thief would have undoubtedly taken. Furthermore, there was complete order in the apartment, no signs of struggle were observed. At first glance, there was no evidence pointing to the killer's recent presence. Examining Jana's body, the police did not notice any serious injuries except for a bruise on her forehead and a bitten lip. She was lying on her back, fully dressed, and the position of her body looked entirely natural. Small blood droplets were visible on her shirt collar and on the carpet near her body. After studying the body, medical experts made several important conclusions. Firstly, death occurred about 10 hours before Spencer found Jenna, meaning she was killed just an hour after she finished talking to him on the phone. Secondly, traces of strangulation were found on her body, which was the cause of death. The experts also determined that the unknown perpetrator did not sexually assault the young woman. However, Jenna tried to fight him off. As evidenced by skin and blood under her fingernails. All of these samples were immediately sent to the laboratory to try to extract a DNA sample of the perpetrator. Of course, her boyfriend, Spencer, became the first suspect for several reasons. Firstly, statistically speaking, murders often turn out to be someone close to the victim. Indicated that Jenna may have known the perpetrator and willingly let them into the apartment. During questioning, Spencer cooperated with the investigation and answered all questions. At that time, however, experts had not yet managed to extract a DNA sample from the killer. Therefore, the police could not verify Spencer's involvement in the murder. Eventually, he was released, but investigators did not rush to clear him of suspicion. Meanwhile, Jenna's friends said that he cherished her deeply and was unlikely to have caused any harm to his beloved. Next, detectives began searching for possible witnesses. The police questioned Jenna's neighbors to find out if they had noticed anything suspicious on the night of the murder. They soon found several guys who were playing volleyball near Jenna's apartment complex at that time. They reported seeing a strange guy who came out of the building near the young woman's apartment. They were surprised that this person was only wearing pants. The witnesses added that the guy looked like 26 years old, Sean Stevens, who lived in the same apartment complex. Upon learning of this, Jenna's friends told the police about another troubling fact. Some time ago, Stevens, who lived right across from Jenna, shouted insults at her from his window. It was not entirely clear what was behind this behavior, but for the police, all of these facts were enough to suspect the young man. Stevens was found and questioned. He claimed to know nothing about the murder and that he did not leave his apartment complex at night, let alone walk around without clothes. 
The police had no way to confirm his words, but without any serious evidence, he had to be released as well. In addition to everything else, the detective studied the possible connection of this murder to Jenna's workplace. However, her colleagues from the restaurant and the surveillance cameras showed that on the day of her death, she did not have any conflicts with anyone and such situations had never arisen before. From this point on, the investigation slowed down. The police continued to search for new leads, questioning Jenna's relatives and friends, and at some point they were able to get a new lead. During a conversation with investigators, the young woman's parents were able to recall important information that could potentially point to another suspect. Two months before Jenna's murder, she complained to her relatives about a repairman who was doing maintenance work in her apartment complex building. One day when she came out of the shower in just a towel, she discovered a stranger in her living room. When she asked him what he was doing in her apartment, he replied that he thought no one was home. The man claimed that he did not hear the running shower and stayed to check the condition of the apartment and make sure nothing needed repair. Of course, Jenna was shocked by such a situation. She found out that the man was 29-year-old Jeremiah Rosser and reported the incident to the building manager. The police conducted a small experiment. One person stood at the entrance door and the other turned down the shower. The sound of running water was very well heard in the living room and even near the entrance door. In such a situation, it was highly unlikely that Rosser did not hear it and thought that no one was home. After talking to the building manager, the police found out that Rosser stopped coming to work a few days after Jenna's murder. This was the reason for his dismissal. All of this looked very suspicious, and the detectives tried to find the man. But here they faced one problem. Rosser moved out of his apartment and they could not determine his current location. The police only managed to find out that he has an ex-wife and two children. Thus, in this complicated case, there were three main suspects, Spencer Hood, Sean Stevens, and Jeremiah Rosser. To determine if one of them was the killer, they had to wait for the results from the lab where experts were trying to extract a DNA sample. They were working on studying the particles under the young woman's nails and drops of blood on her shirt and rug. As a result, they found out that one of the drops of blood on the rug contained genetic material that did not belong to Jenna. This sample matched the one extracted from the particles under the young woman's nails. In the end, the experts were finally able to extract a full DNA sample. The first thing they did was enter it into the FBI database. Were no matches. This meant that the killer had not previously been convicted of any serious crimes. Despite this, the police were now able to match the obtained sample with DNA samples from three main suspects. The problem was only that their samples were not taken during the initial interrogations. Detectives tried to contact them and were surprised to find out that all three had left town. And their current location was unknown. The police immediately began searching for them. Meanwhile, investigators decided not to sit idly by and use the killer's DNA sample. They began voluntarily collecting DNA samples from men who lived in the same complex as Jenna and worked in her restaurant. In total, they managed to obtain 50 DNA samples. But none of them matched the one found at the murder scene. Meanwhile, the police finally managed to find Spencer, who turned out to be three hours' drive from Brian at his parents' house. The young man explained that he could not cope with Jenna's death and decided to spend time with his family to distract himself from this tragedy. He voluntarily provided his DNA sample, which was immediately sent to the laboratory. The young man also allowed experts to examine his body for scratches that would undoubtedly be on the killer. After all, his pieces of skin were found under Jenna's nails. Following this, the police managed to establish Stephen's location, who also went to visit his parents, who live 720 kilometers from Blinn College. He voluntarily provided his DNA sample, which was also sent to the laboratory. While the police were waiting for the results from the laboratory, they had to find the last suspect. This turned out to be much more difficult. The police managed to contact Rosser's ex-wife, who shared some troubling facts. According to her, when their marriage was nearing divorce, Rosser was behaving aggressively towards her. He raised his hand to her, knocked her down, and tried to strangle her which made it impossible to live with him. And the marriage ended in divorce. All of this happened around the same time that Jenna was killed. 
Thanks to his ex-wife, the police were able to locate Rosser. This happened in early October, seven months after the murder. During the interrogation, he behaved quite calmly, answering all the detective's questions. Additionally, the man had never been arrested in his life. He denied his involvement in the murder and, voluntarily, provided his DNA sample. The police also searched his car and found some interesting discoveries. A laptop was found in the car, whose serial number was listed in the theft report. A few months before Jenna's murder, her neighbor contacted the police after her laptop disappeared from her apartment. But that wasn't the worst part. The police also found keys to several apartments in the residential complex where he worked. Considering that he was fired a week after Jenna's murder, Rosser had no right to keep the keys and the manager was obliged to confiscate them. All of this indicated that the man was engaged in petty theft. But could he move on to cold-blooded murder? Meanwhile, experts from the laboratory tested all three DNA samples. It turned out that Jenna's boyfriend and her neighbor had nothing to do with the murder. But Rosser's DNA sample matched the sample found under the victim's nails. Upon receiving the results, the police immediately arrested Rosser, but despite the DNA match, he continued to insist on his innocence. Of course, this did not help him in any way. The man was charged with Jenna's murder. Since Rosser was not eager to disclose the details of that night, the investigators came up with their own version of what happened. Apparently, Rosser broke into Jenna's apartment with the intention of committing robbery, using a key to her door. This could have happened in the evening before 9 p.m. when the young woman had not yet returned home from work. Perhaps Rosser did not have time to commit the intended crime because Jenna came home with her boyfriend, and the criminal had to hide in the second bedroom, where he waited for Spencer to leave. It is possible that it was Rosser who opened the window, hoping to quietly leave the apartment through it, but it did not work out for him. After waiting for Spencer to leave, and hearing Jenna wishing him good night over the phone, Rosser could finally try to leave the apartment through the front door. There are two possible scenarios for what happened next. Either he tried to leave the apartment, but Jenna noticed him first and, in a panic, he attacked her, or he intentionally went to her room planning to commit murder. The police even suggested that he killed the young woman because she resembled his ex-wife. Considering that the man refused to admit his guilt, the case was taken to court. The wait for the trial to begin dragged on for many months, as is often the case in the state's legal system. However, just two weeks before the trial was set to begin, something unexpected happened. In December 2009, more than a year after his arrest, Rosser finally admitted his guilt. He entered into a plea agreement with the prosecutor in the hope of reducing his sentence. The man also asked the investigation not to involve his family in the legal process. His parents and two children from his ex-wife were among them. Thanks to this, the trial was completed in record time. If he had not admitted guilt, the trial could easily have dragged on for several years despite the DNA sample match. As a result, Rosser was sentenced to 55 years in prison. In addition, he received five years in prison for the theft of a laptop. The assistant district attorney said that, to his memory, this was the maximum sentence in the case of a guilty plea. However, Rosser had a much more serious risk, the death penalty. If the investigation had been able to prove that the murder was premeditated and planned, Rosser could have received this sentence. The man was placed in Resharon Prison in Texas. He will be eligible for parole only in 2036. Given that Rosser was 27 at the time of the crime, he may be released early at the age of 55. However, if he serves his full sentence, he will only be released at the age of 82. During the trial he refused to look his relatives and friends of Jenna in the eye. He was led into the courtroom in an orange prison jumpsuit, handcuffed. The man only nodded to his parents in greeting when he saw them in the courtroom. Otherwise he remained silent and unresponsive with his head bowed. The victim's family had the right to speak in court, addressing the murderer directly. All three of them took advantage of this opportunity. Diana's sister stood in the court 60 centimeters away from the perpetrator, saying she hoped Rosser would come to realize the terrible act he had committed. She promised to pray for him and believed that she would someday be able to forgive her sister's killer. Jenna's mother expressed doubt that Rosser regretted his actions. 
She made the killer look her straight in the eye and said with firm conviction that he would never be able to fully understand the horror he had inflicted on their family. The father of Jenna did not plan to speak at the trial but changed his mind at the last moment. He promised to come to any prison where Rosser is placed and tell everyone what a monster he is. He also expressed willingness to attend the hearing in 27 years when Rosser requests parole. In addition, Jenna's parents filed a lawsuit against the owner of the residential complex. They were sure that their daughter's words were not taken seriously when she complained to Rosser's supervisor about his behavior. Moreover, Rosser's keys were not confiscated after his dismissal, indicating the manager's negligence. Jenna's parents believed that their daughter would still be alive if her complaints had been taken seriously and detention had been paid. To Rosser's inappropriate behavior. The only thing that remains unclear to this day is Rosser's exact motives. Despite confessing to the murder, he refused to reveal the reasons for his actions. In any case, it doesn't matter anymore, his guilt is evident and he deserves to spend the rest of his life in prison. Share your opinion on this story and don't forget to give this video a like. If you enjoyed it, a young woman went missing on her way home from the bus stop. Police began a search and initially thought it would be an easy case, but to everyone's surprise, this story became one of the most complex and high profile in British criminal history. Although the case was closed fairly quickly, its echoes have not subsided to this day, causing a lot of outrage and controversy. Helen McCourt was born on July 29, 1965 in the English town of Boodle. Soon she had a younger brother and from an early age, the girl helped take care of him. Later their parents divorced, her mother married another man, and they, along with Helen and her brother, moved to a small village called Billing, located near the city. It was a quiet, peaceful place where not a single serious crime could occur for decades. The locals knew each other well and were not afraid that something bad could happen in their village. Helen grew up in this peaceful environment, had many friends and was an exemplary daughter. After graduating from school, she got a job at an insurance company located in Liverpool. The young woman stayed in Billings so she had to get to the office by train and bus. On February 9, 1988. When Helen was 22 years old, she went to work as usual. She had agreed to have lunch with her mother that day, since her mother worked just a few streets away from her. However, the weather suddenly turned bad that day, with strong winds and rain, so they decided to postpone their lunch. Her mother came home significantly earlier, and Helen called her towards the end of her shift. She told her mother that she had planned to go on a date that evening and asked her to heat up dinner for her arrival so that she could wash her hair. Usually Helen returned home just after 5 p.m., but that day she was clearly delayed and her mother began to worry. However, soon after, the news reported that a fallen tree on one of the railroad lines, due to the bad weather, had temporarily paralyzed the train service. Her mother began to worry again and decided to call the railroad service. She explained the situation, but the operator stated that the fallen tree had blocked another road and it did not affect the train schedules that Helen would have taken. At that moment, the woman began to seriously consider that something had happened to her daughter. Firstly, Helen almost always returned home from work on time. If she planned to stay out late. Although there were no mobile phones back then, Helen could have made a call from work or any telephone booth, which were found almost on every corner. The mother thought that Helen might have been in trouble due to the bad weather. For example, she might have fallen due to the heavy rain and wind and hurt herself. The woman and her son then started calling local hospitals in all nearby towns. No one resembling Helen had been admitted. The mother also considered the possibility that her daughter might have stayed late at work and called the office, but they told her that Helen had left several hours ago. None of her friends knew where she was either. Afterwards, Helen's mother, stepfather, and boyfriend decided to go on a search. They walked along the road that Helen used to take home from work. Helen always took the same route. Taking a train from Liverpool to the small town of St. Helens and then taking a bus to Billing. However, they were unable to find her, so the family decided to contact the police. They first notified officers in Liverpool and the surrounding areas, distributing descriptions of the missing young woman, but no one was able to find her. 
The next morning, when Helen had still not returned home or contacted anyone, the police decided to retrace her steps and reconstruct the timeline of events from the previous evening. They wanted to understand at what point along her journey from work to home she went missing. To do this, investigators appealed to the public for witnesses. They also spoke with Helen's colleagues, employees at the train station and bus company. As a result, they came to an unexpected conclusion. They were able to confirm that on the night of her disappearance, she not only took a train but also a bus to her village. This was strange because the bus stop was only 200 meters from her home. Detectives began to suspect that she might have been abducted because if it wasn't an accident, she would have been discovered by now. As part of the standard procedure, detectives began to investigate people close to Helen. Since, in most cases, they are the ones behind such crimes. Her boyfriend and stepfather had reliable alibis for that evening and Aunt Helen's friends and acquaintances were also excluded from the list of possible suspects. Forming search teams of 120 officers, the police began a detailed search of the area between the bus stop and Helen's house, hoping to find any clues, such as a piece or something that the potential kidnapper might have dropped. At the same time, leaflets with information about the missing young woman were distributed in nearby towns. Divers searched local water bodies and police officers knocked on every door, questioning people. They also went to all the shops, bars, and cafes in Billings. After talking to the staff at a bar called George and Dragon, they got their first lead. This establishment was located near Helen's house, and she occasionally went there with her friends. But investigators found out that just two days before her disappearance, the bar owner banned her from the bar after an incident. She'd had a quarrel with a drunk woman who spilled her drink on her. Helen didn't want to provoke the conflict and went to the toilet to try to clean her clothes, but the drunken woman followed her and started acting aggressively. At some point, she even tried to hit her, after which the bar owner kicked them both out. Moreover, he forbade them from ever returning. The police decided to learn more about this conflict and went to the bar the next day to talk to its owner, Ian Simpson. Moreover, this establishment was located right between the bus stop and Helen's house. The man told detectives about that evening and said that he had to kick both young women out so that their conflict didn't disturb other visitors. During their conversation, the bar slowly filled with people and it became noisy. Then the police suggested that Ian ride with them to the station to continue the dialogue in a more peaceful environment. And here, something strange happened. The man noticeably became nervous, refused to go with them, and tried to end the conversation. All of this seemed suspicious to investigators. Why was Ian so afraid to go to the station? Perhaps he had something to do with Helen's disappearance or he knew more than he said. They decided to keep an eye on him and found out that the man was known for his philandering. Despite being a married man with two children, Ian constantly flirted with other women. And all the villagers knew about it. The police also found out that he constantly paid attention to Helen when she came to the bar. The investigators once again approached him and asked where he was on the evening of Helen's disappearance. The man explained that he was spending time with his lover in an apartment located above a bar. According to him, he spent most of his time there. Because he was afraid that his establishment could be robbed. The detective spoke with his lover and here they encountered an interesting twist. The woman claimed that she and Ian had indeed planned to meet at his apartment at around 7 p.m. However, that evening, he called her and asked her to come a few hours later. In the end, she arrived at around half past eight, but the man wasn't home. He returned only around half past eleven. All of this looked extremely suspicious. Obviously, Ian lied to the police about his alibi, which automatically made him a suitable candidate for the role of suspect. One more detail seemed strange to the detectives. The man had several fresh scratches on his neck. He said he got them during a fight with his wife when she found out about his lover. However, the investigator spoke with the woman and she denied scratching her husband. The police spoke with Ian again and he changed his story. Now the man claimed that he got the scratches while separating Helen and another drunk young woman on the evening when a scuffle happened in the bar. The detective spoke with this young woman, but she denied this story. According to her, they didn't come to blows and none of them scratched the bar owner. 
Soon, the police got a witness who told them a worrying fact. On the evening of Helen's disappearance, he was passing through that street and at some point heard a piercing female scream. It was coming from the bar, but it quickly cut off. Based on all this, the detectives began to think that 31-year-old Ian Sims had to direct the Hallens' disappearance. However, he continued to deny everything. The investigators needed serious evidence to tie him to this case. Otherwise, they would be powerless. Police decided to search his car where they found two gruesome pieces of evidence. Firstly, they found several blood stains, and secondly, a part of a woman's earring was lying on the floor. They immediately took the earring to Hallen's mother, who without a doubt confirmed that it belonged to her daughter. After that, Ian was arrested on charges of kidnapping and murder, even though the police still didn't know what had happened to Helen. They searched the bar and the apartment on the second floor where they found new evidence. In both places, there were many barely noticeable blood stains that had clearly been attempted to be washed away. On one of these spots, the criminalists found a fingerprint. That belonged to Ian. Moreover, in the apartment, they found the missing part of the same earring that was previously discovered in his car. Despite such an impressive set of evidence, the man continued to deny everything. By this point, the police thought that Helen was dead. They needed to find her body. Otherwise, the court could justify Ian. They believed that the blood in his apartment and car belonged to the young woman. But in those years, DNA analysis was just beginning to be used in forensics, and organizing such research was very problematic. The man himself told the police that the blood belonged to his dog, which injured its paw. In an attempt to find more evidence, investigators decided to appeal to the public to organize more extensive searches. More than 2,000 people responded to their call, including both residents of the village and nearby settlements. Together with the police, they searched the area around Billing, including forests and fields. Soon, a new piece of evidence did appear in this case, but it was not discovered by volunteers. 25 kilometers from the village, in a place called Collins Green, a man walking his dog noticed a towel on the ground with traces of blood. He looked around and saw another such towel, as well as several pillowcases. In addition, he found men's socks, a sweater and underwear nearby. Some of these items were also covered in blood. He reported his findings to the police and they took the items to a storage facility for evidence. But here was one problem. Considering that this area was 25 kilometers from Billing, police officers from another department arrived at the call they did not connect this find with Helen McCord's case, and the investigators who were searching for her didn't even know about the discovery of the bloody items. In the end, the police eventually saw a connection between the cases and the inscription on the found sweater helped them. It was a print with an advertisement for a beer brand that was being sold on promotion at the George and Dragon Bar at the time. Investigators concluded that all of these things, with a high degree of probability, belonged to Ian Sims. Thus, the detectives had numerous blood samples, but they did not have Helen's body to request a DNA analysis. It was 1988 and such tools were not yet widely used. The police decided to compare the blood samples from the bar, Ian's car, and the witnesses found items with the blood of Helen's closest relatives. Her parents and younger brother. The results show that these samples were very close and the blood almost certainly belonged to close relatives. Thus, the detectives were convinced that the blood samples belonged to Helen. This unequivocally indicated that Ian was clearly involved in her disappearance, but they still needed more evidence. The problem was that the expression, no body, no case, did not appear out of nowhere. The British court rarely passed guilty verdicts in murder cases if the victim's body was not found. No matter how weighty the evidence may have seemed in the eyes of justice, there was always a slight chance that the victim might not be dead. The police hoped that they would be able to gather more information against Ian, so they questioned all of his acquaintances. After talking to the bar cleaner, they learned about another suspicious incident. The woman told them that on the morning after Helen's disappearance, she came to work as usual to clean the premises. To her surprise, she saw the owner himself doing a general cleaning. He was washing the floors, walls, and tables. Moreover, judging by the scale of the work, he had been doing it for more than an hour. The problem was that this had never happened before. 
Ian had never participated in cleaning his bar and in general, he rarely got up so early. Usually, when the cleaner came for her morning shift, the man was still sleeping in his apartment upstairs. When she asked him why he had suddenly decided to clean the entire premises himself, Ian replied that his dog had made a mess. Another witness told the police that he had passed by this bar at night and heard the sound of a working vacuum cleaner from inside. The police concluded that the man had been sleeping in his apartment upstairs. That Ian had been trying to get rid of the blood stains all night but he had not been able to completely complete the task. Despite all this, even with the suspicion surrounding Ian, they still needed more evidence. Investigators tried to find the young woman's body but even extensive searches yielded no results. A month later, another piece of evidence fell into their hands. About 30 kilometers from Billings and noticed a woman's purse in the grass. Looking inside, he found documents in the name of Helen McCourt. The police arrived at the scene and soon they found even more evidence. Nearby they discovered the clothing the young woman was wearing on the day of her disappearance, as well as a second earring identical to the one found in Ian's car. But a more horrific discovery awaited the detectives. A coiled cable was lying near the clothes tangled with female hair. They were sent to the laboratory and soon the experts confirmed that the hair belonged to Helen McCourt. Examining the young woman's purse, investigators found a check from a pharmacy in St. Helens. It turned out that she went there shopping on the evening of her disappearance, just before taking the bus to Billings. The police found all the items purchased at the pharmacy near the purse, except for one, a toothbrush. But soon, they found it, too, not 30 kilometers from the village next to the purse, but in the same bar as Ian Simpson, where investigators were still conducting extensive searches. They also managed to find a hairpin, and Helen's mother confirmed that the young woman went to work with her that morning. But that was not all. In the bar they found a clump of female hair that belonged to Helen, confirmed by DNA analysis. Despite all of this, the detectives continued to cling to every detail and handed over the woman's clothing to the laboratory. After a thorough examination forensic experts found traces of carpet on it, identical to the one in the in addition, they found traces of dog hair on the clothing, which matched the hair of Ian's dog. After that, the experts began to study two rings and a bracelet that were seized from the man after his arrest. Forensic experts found traces of dirt on them and compared them with the soil in the area where bloody towels and Ian's clothing were found. As surprising as it may sound, they were able to prove that the dirt was from that region. Which once again confirmed that the man was there and had himself thrown away these things. Soon after this, the police found another piece of evidence. Near the town of Rixton, located 24 kilometers from Billings, they found a shovel. They were able to determine that the shovel belonged to Ian Simpson and apparently he used it to bury Helen's body. However, they still couldn't find the body itself. Despite the constant work of hundreds of volunteers, the young woman's relatives were almost 100% sure that she was dead. With such a colossal set of evidence, waiting for a miracle was simply pointless. Yet they couldn't finally confirm this and give her a decent burial, as well as be sure that the perpetrator would be punished. Ian continued to insist that he had nothing to do with the murder, and eventually, he the police handed the case over to the court. The trial began a year after Helen's disappearance in February 1989. This was one of the first cases in Britain where a person was tried for murder in the absence of the victim's body. Therefore, despite the huge amount of evidence, the prosecution doubted their victory. According to their version, that evening Helen got off the bus and headed home along her usual route. When she passed by the George and Dragon bar, Ian Simpson noticed her and started talking to her on some pretext. Perhaps the man was trying to discuss with her the incident that led to him banning her from his establishment. Then he must have lured her inside somehow. According to the investigation, Ian could have offered to resolve the conflict and lift the ban on her visiting the bar. Where Helen could go with her friends, she was interested in resolving the conflict. Apparently the man lured her inside the building where there was no one else at the time. Almost immediately after that, he attacked her, which was confirmed by the testimony of a passing witness. He heard a female scream that was quickly cut off. 
Attacking Helen, Ian killed her with an electric cable and dragged her into his second floor from there. He possibly subjected the young woman to violence, after which he waited for darkness and loaded the body into his car. The man drove her away from Billing and buried her, after which he scattered her things, his clothes, and other items in other remote places. There were several versions regarding his motives. The first one was forced, from the testimony of many witnesses, the investigation knew that Ian had repeatedly shown signs of attention to the young woman. But she always refused him. Probably that evening he saw an opportunity to fulfill his criminal desires. The second version was that during their conversation, some conflict arose between them and he killed her in a fit of rage. It is possible that he and Helen began to argue and she threatened to tell his wife about his constant harassment. However, this theory looked less realistic. After the prosecution spoke in court, it was Ian's turn. He still claimed that he was completely innocent and told his version, and it was one of the strangest speeches ever made by a man accused of murder. The man claimed that someone framed him, someone else sneaked into the bar, put on his clothes, lured Helen there and killed her. After that he put her body in Ian's car and buried it with Ian's shovel in an unknown place. The killer drove the car back to the bar and disappeared, framing the innocent bar owner. After such statements, the jurors became even more convinced that Ian was directly involved in the murder. His story sounded completely absurd. Perhaps he already understood that he would most likely go to prison and decided to make fun of the justice system and the victim's relatives. As a result, on March 14, 1989, the man was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment with the right to apply for parole no earlier than 16 years in prison. Unfortunately, for Helen's family, it was far from the end. The police and volunteers continued to search for her body, but without success. Three years after the sentencing, the young woman's mother wrote a letter to the killer, desperately pleading to reveal the location of her daughter's body. After some time, Ian replied, but his letter contained only insults and threats. He promised to take revenge on the woman as soon as he was released from prison. The killer repeatedly appealed, but all his appeals were rejected. Only in 2004, when he had already spent 15 years behind bars, one of the appeals was granted and the case was sent for review. It did not play in the killer's favor. With the help of modern DNA analysis tools, experts examined the evidence and concluded that all of them unequivocally proved Ian's guilt. As a result, the case review essentially led to an increase in the prison sentence. After 16 years, the criminal repeatedly applied for release, but all his applications were rejected. Helen's family continued to fight to find her body. In 2015, her mother launched a public campaign seeking to change existing laws. She demanded that convicted murderers be denied early release until they disclosed the location of their victim's body. The woman gave interviews to various channels, wrote letters to Prime Minister Theresa May, and also created a petition that gathered hundreds of thousands of signatures. As a result, this issue was brought to Parliament for consideration and initially, politicians positively assessed the possibility of passing such a law. However, time passed and Helen's mother initiative was constantly delayed. All these delays led to the fact that in November 2019, after 30 years of imprisonment, Ian Sims finally achieved early release. This event was a heavy blow to the young woman's family, as they had practically lost any hope of finding the location of her remains. Three months after the decision was made, the killer was released. 63-year-old Ian Sims returned to a normal life. However, he did not enjoy his freedom for long. In late June 2022, the man died from an illness, taking the secret of Helen's body's location with him to the grave. Helen's mother is still alive and does not plan to give up. She now hopes that Ian may have told someone among his cellmates where he hid the body. She also continues to fight for the adoption of a law that would prohibit the early release of murderers who refuse to disclose the location of their victim. Thus, the Helen McCourt case lasted for several decades, although it was solved in a matter of days. Despite the overwhelming evidence against the criminal, he continued to keep secret information that would have allowed the relatives of his victim to say goodbye to her and start to heal their wounds. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. A 16-year-old young woman went home on her bicycle and disappeared. 
The next day her body was found in a field near the road, the unknown perpetrator had killed her and fled. Despite the fact that the police had a DNA sample of the perpetrator, they could not find him until 13 years later. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Marianne Vastra and why this murder is in Dutch history. Marianne Vestra was born on August 10, 1982, in the Netherlands. She lived with her parents in De Westreen, a small village in the north of the country, far from large cities. The young woman was the youngest of six children, she had two brothers and three sisters. Over time almost all of the older children left for other cities and countries, and Marianne was left to live with her parents and one older brother. The young woman studied at the local school, was fond of music and had many friends. The area where she lived was dotted with small towns and settlements located a few kilometers apart. For this reason, Marianne often went to other localities to spend time with friends or go shopping. In her free time, she also worked at the local supermarket as a part-time employee. On April 30, 1999, the country celebrated a big holiday. Queen's Day. Marianne finished her shift at the store and went to a nearby town called Colum to spend the evening with her friends at a local cafe. A few hours later their company was joined by Marianne's boyfriend and his friends, and together they all decided to go to a settlement called Boykin Post, which was six kilometers away. The group rode there on their bicycles, but Marianne did not have one, so she borrowed a bicycle and went for a ride with her friends. After a while they decided to go home and the young woman headed in the direction of her town, which was about 11 kilometers away, but she never made it home. Her parents thought that Marianne had stayed the night with a friend who lived in Colum, although this was doubtful. The young woman had promised to be home by evening and if she had decided to spend the night at her friends, she would certainly have called home. Early in the morning, Marianne's father called at the house of her best friend, Affie. To his surprise, he heard that his daughter had said goodbye to her friend that night and had it home. At this point, it became clear to everyone that something bad might have happened to Marianne. Her friend called her boyfriend, took her sister with her, and together they drove along the route Marianne took home. Meanwhile, the young woman's father decided to go to the police immediately. He told them that his daughter had not returned home and none of her friends knew where she was. Soon two officers arrived to take a missing persons report. After which they returned to the station and prepared to begin their search. Meanwhile, Affy and her sister and boyfriend were driving near the settlement of Finklister with vast fields on either side of the road. At one point they noticed something shiny in the grass and stopped. As they approached the field, they saw a bicycle lying in the grass. A little further away, about 15 meters away, was the awful sight of Marianne laying there. She had no clothes on and there was a cut on her neck. All three were shocked. Affy wanted to check Marianne's pulse, but could not bring herself to approach the body. It was obvious that the young woman was dead. But her best friend couldn't believe it because of the intense shock. She struggled to get her phone out and called the police. Several officers arrived on the scene at once and two police officers went to Marianne's family home. At the time, they did not yet have official confirmation of the victim's identity, so the officers picked up her father and drove him to the scene. Forensic investigators were already on the scene at the time and the father, to his grief, immediately identified Marianne. After examining the scene, the detectives noticed an important detail. There were two bicycle tracks leading from the road to the place where the young woman's body was lying and only one track in the opposite direction. That meant the killer was also on a bicycle. The police searched the surrounding area for clues and even conducted aerial photography, but the only thing they could find near the murder scene was a lighter. And did not have a lighter, so the police sent her to the lab. Medical examiners determined that the young woman had been abused and found traces of semen from which they were able to compile a sample of the killer's DNA. The same DNA was found on the lighter. It was uploaded to the police database, but there is no matches. This meant that the perpetrator had no previous criminal record. The police chose a Marianne boyfriend named Spencer as a suspect. There was no evidence against him, but it seemed to the head of the local police department that the boy was the most likely killer in such a case. However, the young man voluntarily provided his DNA sample and it did not match the one found on the victim's body. In the meantime, the crime had been covered extensively in the local media and on television. 
Such murders were almost unheard of and the public demanded that the police catch the culprit as soon as possible. The problem was that detectives were already deadlocked within the first week. They had a DNA sample of the killer, but no suspects. The police also received numerous calls from local residents. Some of them thought someone they knew might be behind the murder, but there was no confirmation of any of those theories. Pointed to one specific place. Near the field where Marianne's body was found was a migration center for people who had applied for asylum. Most of the people there were from Iran and Syria. With each passing day, this theory spread through the local towns. And at one point, an impressive number of people were 100% certain that a refugee had committed the murder. Because of this, the police had to investigate this possibility. On May 5th, Marianne's funeral was held. Almost 1,500 people came to support her family at that moment, many from neighboring communities. Two days later, the woman's parents organized a memorial procession, at the end of which they addressed the public. A total of about 20,000 people took part in the event, mostly due to the active national coverage of the case. More and more people contacted the police each day. And at one point the detectives got a really interesting lead. Several people reported seeing Marianne at a cafe one night as a certain oriental-looking guy approached her and tried to get to know her. After the young woman refused, the guy made a gesture toward her with his thumb along her throat. Given that the young woman was killed in this manner, the police immediately began searching for the young man. He turned out to be a 15-year-old refugee from the same migration center. He admitted that he had indeed made such a gesture, but denied any involvement in the murder. The boy gave a DNA sample and it did not match the one found on the victim's body. Despite this, local residents continued to blame the refugees from the migration center. The organization even had to hire additional security guards in case of possible conflicts. Twelve days after the murder, people came out to the migration center to protest. At first they simply shouted out demands to give them the murderer, but by evening the situation had escalated greatly. Several people threw Molotov cocktails in the direction of the building, forcing the police to intervene. Since then, security at the center has been significantly stepped up, and there have been no more demonstrations of this kind. A few days later, the police announced the arrest of a 32-year-old man named Pitt, who lived in the same town as Marianne. He was a local alcoholic and was disliked by most of the residents. The arrest came after a witness contacted the police that he had seen Pitt in bloody clothes the night of the murder. The man was detained and his DNA sample was sent to the lab. Almost instantly, journalists spread the word nationwide about the new suspect. The DNA didn't match the sample and the witness admitted to making up the whole story in retaliation against Pitt for a personal grudge. Investigating a possible connection to the immigration center, police began examining the logbook which records all movements of refugees from the asylum area. They had the right to leave the center, but to do so they had to check the log and indicate where they were going and why. It turned out that two refugees had left the center on the night of the murder, but had not indicated where they were going. They were 26-year-old Ali and 19-year-old Mohammed. Police began looking into their possible involvement, but no details were released for a long time. Marianne's father was unhappy that investigators were keeping his family in the dark and still hadn't found the killer. He contacted a well-known crime reporter who agreed to take over the case and tried to find more information. On July 1st, the father of the victim appeared on a popular television program where he voiced the facts discovered by the journalist. First, the two refugees who left the center on the night of the murder were in the same cafe as Marianne. They also left almost immediately after the young woman left with her friends. Second, since that very night, the whereabouts of these men have been unknown. They had not returned to the center and the police could not find them. At the same time, they had photographs of both men, but for some reason, the authorities did not publish them. After all these facts were made public on television, the police stated that they were currently searching for these suspects together with Interpol. The main theory is that they may have fled the country. All this has again aggravated relations between local residents and refugees. In early October, they again gathered outside the center to protest. On October 9th, Turkish police reported the arrest of one of the suspects, 26-year-old Ali. 
It turned out that all this time he had been living in Istanbul. He was taken to the Netherlands, where a DNA sample was taken and the necessary tests conducted. It did not match the sample found on the victim's body, and the man was cleared of suspicion. The investigation has since stalled again, and at some point, the police and Marianne's family began to suspect her boyfriend again. Even though his DNA did not match the sample, Spencer's behavior seemed suspicious. The young woman's acquaintances and relatives were certain that Marianne would never ride her bike home at night because she was afraid of the dark and the distance was not that short. Spencer should have sent her home by cab, which even Marianne's parents knew. Instead, he let her go alone on her bicycle. The young man was questioned several more times, and here began something strange. He changed his testimony about that evening several times. Originally, Spencer said that he had met Marianne at a cafe, after which they drove to the Buton Post. On re-examination, however, he stated that the young woman had gone there with friends before he even got to the cafe. So Spencer went to her on his bicycle. He went on to say that on the way there, he saw two guys walking with a bicycle. At one interrogation, Spencer said he did not recognize them because it was very dark outside. Then, he said they were two of his friends. This all seemed strange, but the police had no evidence against Spencer and his DNA did not match the killer's sample. The case stalled for several more months. On December 20th, the police decided to enlist the help of the public and asked all the men in the area to volunteer their DNA samples. But there was trouble waiting for them. It turned out that the law forbade the mass collection of DNA from citizens even with their consent. So the authorities set a limit for the police. They could only take 150 samples, among which there was not a single match. From that point on, the case practically came to a standstill for several years. Marianne's parents tried to push for a change in the law that would have allowed extensive DNA screening, but they were turned down. The rationale was to protect people's privacy, even though such measures had already led to the capture of the perpetrator several times in other countries. In July 2001, the detectives announced an approximate profile of the perpetrator. They believed the killer was a local man between the ages of 20 and 40. The police again requested permission to conduct a large-scale collection of DNA samples within a 5-kilometer radius of the Marianne murder scene. But they were again denied. After that, the case finally came to a standstill. The victim's parents continued to participate in television shows and gave interviews, but each year, the case attracted less and less attention. There was no new evidence to help solve the gruesome mystery. In 2010, the police assembled a team that created a detailed 3D model of the crime scene and all available evidence using the latest computer technology. This again drew widespread public attention, and Marianne's parents again talked about the need for DNA screening. This time, 11 years after their daughter's murder, authorities decided to finally consider changing the law. The process took almost two years, and on September 6, 2012, the necessary amendments were passed. Police called a press conference to ask all men who were between 20 and 40 years old in 1999 to submit their DNA samples. The collection area was also limited to 5 kilometers. They estimated they were talking about 8,000 men, but not all of them agreed to give their DNA. The police managed to collect just over 6,500 samples and experts began to study them. Unfortunately, the resources of the lab were limited. They had time to check about 400 samples a week, so the study had to take up to four months. The experts compared the samples to the killer's DNA profile, but they weren't just looking for a complete match. After all, it was unlikely the perpetrator would have given his DNA to the police. The lab was also trying to figure out the similarities by which they could establish kinship and trace back to the killer through a father, brother, or other relative. On November 19th, a month after the test began, experts finally got a long-awaited match. Was that they didn't just find a familial link, they got the DNA of the killer himself, meaning he voluntarily provided it to the police. Detectives soon announced the arrest of 45-year-old Jasper Syringa, a local farmer and father of two. His house was only a few kilometers from where Marianne was killed. At first, the man kept silent, but after a conversation with his lawyer, he decided to confess. 
But the public only learned the details of this terrible crime on March 28, 2013, when the trial began. According to Jasper, that late evening he was finishing up chores on his farm and decided to ride his bicycle before going to bed. As he himself admitted most of the time, riding his bicycle was just a cover for him. In fact, he was riding to a neighboring village to take advantage of the intimate services of local women. His wife was unaware of this, but in court he said that he had not intended to go there that night and had simply planned a ride to take his mind off family problems and difficulties on the farm. At one point he noticed Marianne alone on an empty and dark road. Then it occurred to him that he could do whatever he wanted with her. Jasper drove up to her, took a penknife from his pocket and threatened to silence her. He then took her to a field, where he abused and killed her. At the trial, the man insisted that he did not mean to kill the young woman and did it out of panic. He realized what he had done and what the consequences would be for his entire family. His children were five and eight years old at the time and they were about to find out what their father had done. For this reason, Jasper decided to kill Marianne and go into hiding, but his conscience has been bothering him ever since. He continued to live in the area, listening to talk about the murder and seeing the family of his victim, whose lives would never be the same again because of his heinous act. Since then, he has repeated thoughts of turning himself into the police, but he's never made up his mind. When a massive DNA screening was announced in 2012, Jasper realized he would be figured out. He had so many relatives in the neighborhood, and one of them would certainly have turned in his DNA. Experts would find a partial match and start looking into all his relatives, which would inevitably lead to his capture. So Jasper decided to give his DNA, but he still couldn't bring himself to come to the police station and confess. The trial lasted only a few weeks, and on April 19th, the judge pronounced his sentence 18 years in prison out of a possible 20 years under Dutch law. After 13 years Marianne's relatives finally saw the perpetrator punished, but the judicial system gave them an unpleasant surprise. Due to his good behavior, Jasper is scheduled to be released as early as 2023, meaning he has spent less than 10 years behind bars. Share your opinion on this case in the comments below. A young woman disappeared from her apartment, which she rented with her sister. The police couldn't find a single clue, and the case went cold for decades. It wasn't until 53 years later that they were able to uncover the gruesome truth, and it happened in a very unusual way. In the small American town of Helena, Montana. She grew up in a close-knit family and had many friends. Her acquaintances noted that the girl from an early age was responsible and could always come to their aid. Pamela also loved animals and her parents bought her a black Labrador. She did well in the local school and in high school, she was passionate about learning the Russian language. After high school, the young woman took a job as a surgical nurse at St. Peter's Hospital in her hometown. Although her parents' home was relatively close to work, Pamela sought to establish an independent life. For this reason, she moved out of her parents' house and moved into a rented apartment with her cousin Mary, who worked at the same hospital. The young woman rented a two-bedroom apartment on the second floor of an apartment complex. Early in the morning on February 17, 1968, Mary went to work at the hospital. Pamela was still asleep since she had to go out for the evening shift that day. The Labrador also slept in her room. A few hours after Mary left for work, Pamela's father drove by their apartment complex. Near the building he noticed his daughter's Labrador running around without a leash. The week before, the dog had broken loose and run away from its owner and Pamela had to pick it up from the local shelter. So what he saw didn't surprise the man. He knocked on the door of their apartment but there was no answer. Thinking his daughter had gone to work, he took the dog and left. At 3 p.m. Pamela was supposed to go to work, but she never showed up at the hospital. Her cousin tried to call the home phone at their apartment but there was no answer. When she got home, Pamela wasn't there, and Mary and her parents began to get seriously worried. Pamela was a very responsible person and would never miss her shift without a good reason, especially without notifying management. Besides, if the young woman was going somewhere, she would certainly tell her parents and sister. Another cause for concern was the fact that Pamela's car was parked in the parking lot of the apartment complex. 
This fact also made it less likely that the young woman had gone somewhere on foot all day. The relatives waited until the next morning and contacted the police. They took a missing persons report but were in no hurry to start a search. Pamela was 19 years old and investigators did not rule out that she left home of her own free will. After inspecting her apartment, detectives found no signs of forced entry or a struggle. Everything looked routine. They asked her sister to look through Pamela's things and tell her if everything was there. Mary noticed that her coat, terry cloth robe, purse and winter boots were missing from their apartment. Two days after Pamela's disappearance, police organized a search operation within a 30-kilometer radius of her home. They searched fields, forests and bodies of water while volunteers and the young woman's relatives handed out flyers on the city streets, patrolmen interviewed Pamela's neighbors, co-workers and acquaintances. None of them had seen the young woman the day she disappeared and had no idea where she might have gone. Her supervisor at the hospital said Pamela was supposed to pick up a check for $200 that day, but never showed up. This further indicated that the young woman was unlikely to have run off somewhere, leaving behind the money she had earned. In the first days of the search, police interviewed more than a hundred people who had anything to do with Pamela. Some of them were interrogated by polygraph, but it yielded no results. Investigators were also unable to find any evidence that the young woman might have left town. With no leads on their hands, the police concentrated all their efforts on the search operation. They expanded the area to about 50 kilometers around the city and brought in additional forces. Because many parts of the area were not easily accessible to pedestrians and cars, the search involved many officers on horseback. Speaking to reporters, the sheriff said that this was the most effective, as a person on horseback could see better and an animal could smell a dead body and demonstrate this behavior. The search continued for a month, but was inconclusive and eventually the sheriff decided to suspend the search operation. Since then, the case has essentially come to a standstill as the detectives have had no leads on their hands. In April, two months after Pamela disappeared, something unusual happened. A patrolman in Great Falls, a town about 140 kilometers from Helena, stopped a car for speeding. He issued a warning to the woman behind the wheel and let her go. Later, as he was writing the report at the station, his colleagues noticed one odd thing. The driver's license the woman showed the officer was issued in the name of Pamela Dorrington. The Helena detectives asked for a description of the woman's appearance, and from what he said, it looked very much like she was the one behind the wheel. This news gave new hope to the relatives. Of the missing young woman, except that investigators never managed to find the car and its driver. On June 13th of that year, nearly four months after Pamela's disappearance, the sheriff's office received a call. A national park ranger just a few miles from Helena was walking near the docks at the lake and noticed a human body in the water. From the water, it was turned over to experts who proceeded to examine it and determine that it belonged to a woman about 17 to 23 years old. Detectives almost immediately made the assumption that the deceased was Pamela Dorrington. Along with it, they found several items of clothing that were similar to items from Pamela's closet. They showed them to her sister and parents and they confirmed that Pamela did have something similar. The medical examiners found several stab wounds on it and signs that the young woman had been abused, but the torso alone could not be identified. All of this was before DNA testing was available. The only thing the experts could surmise was the approximate time the body had been in the water. In their opinion, it could have been there for about four months, which coincided with the time of Pamela's disappearance. In the weeks that followed, investigators, along with divers, searched the lake and the adjacent Missouri River, trying to find missing body parts. But it was inconclusive. Despite failing to identify the deceased, the sheriff told reporters that the body was very likely Pamela's, so police were no longer investigating a missing person, but a murder. However, this discovery did not bring them any closer to the perpetrator himself. As there were still no leads. Since then, there has been no progress in the case. Police told reporters and Pamela's family that they had several suspects, but it was impossible to determine their involvement without any evidence. A year after the murder, the sheriff contacted a psychologist in Detroit who specialized in particularly violent crimes. From the information available, he concluded that the perpetrator was a psychopath. 
with twisted desires which was the motive for the murder. Given this, it is unlikely that he could have stopped at one murder and detectives should expect more similar episodes. At the same time, the expert suggested that this man was capable of easily hiding his true face and leading an ordinary lifestyle. All this information did not help the sheriff much, but no other threads of the investigation he no longer saw. The man gave the psychologist the names of his suspects and asked him to assess which of them could commit such a crime. But the expert could not draw such conclusions without additional evidence. Pamela was not buried until seven years after the murder on June 14, 1975. In all that time, investigators never found her other remains nor did they come any closer to catching the perpetrator. They continued to consider all sorts of possibilities. Once the detectives even turned to clairvoyance, but the result was quite expected. Fifteen years after the 1983 murder, something interesting happened. The landlord of the apartment Pamela and Mary had rented was found guilty of murdering his wife. In 1968, a man named Brooke Atlas lived on the first floor, directly below their apartment. He had been on the list of possible suspects since the early days, but a complete lack of evidence prevented any conclusions about his involvement. He later married and moved into a private home with his wife. In 1983, their home burned down and experts were quick to determine that it was arson. Moreover, the body of Ellis's wife was found in the house, but the cause of her death was not fire. The pathologist determined that she had been killed by strangulation. Investigators assumed that the man decided to get rid of his wife and house because of financial problems. Shortly before, he had declared bankruptcy and the loss of his insured home could have resulted in a hefty payout from the insurance company, but instead he received a life sentence for murder without parole and an additional 20 years for arson. We're interested in this episode. Atlas, who lived literally a foot away from the victim, had the opportunity to kill her. The man could have used a spare key, and over the months of living near the young woman, he may have well learned their work schedules. Detectives talked to Atlas, but he denied all allegations. Given that there was not a single piece of evidence against him, the cops had no choice but to accept it and hoped that sooner or later new leads would emerge in the case. In the 38 years that followed, no progress was made. Pamela's parents passed away without learning the truth. And of her closest relatives, she had only a younger brother. He had given up hope of finding out what had happened to his sister. But in 2021, the case was given another chance. It was turned over to the unsolved homicide squad. The new detectives decided to reopen the investigation. Pamela's murder was not typical of such units, they usually reopened old cases where the perpetrator left his DNA behind, but because of the lack of analytical tools in those years, it was impossible to use that to catch the killer. In Pamela's case, there was no evidence at all and the detectives could only hope for luck. They studied all the materials left by their predecessors, including a list of possible suspects. Brooke Atlas stood out clearly since he had already been in prison for the murder of his wife. The man was 79 years old at the time and was still serving his sentence. Investigators realized that proving his guilt after 53 years would be very difficult. And the man was unlikely to live to see sentencing. Not only could the trial drag on for years without a single piece of evidence, but no judge would even consider such a case. So the detectives decided to take a very unusual approach to the matter. They went to Atlas in prison and offered him a confession to Pamela's murder. In exchange, they guaranteed him that he would receive no additional punishment for it. Such moves on the part of law enforcement are quite rare, especially when it comes to a brutal murder. But in this particular case, they knew they had only two options. Wait until they got their hands on some new evidence, which was highly unlikely, or get a confession. And given Atlas's age, the second option could disappear at any moment. Besides, Pamela's only living close relative was her brother, who was also of advanced age. The detectives wanted him to know the truth, told him about the possibility of such a deal, and the man agreed. The investigators brought their offer to Atlas and waited. To their surprise it worked. The perpetrator said he was ready to confess, but the detectives were in no hurry to rejoice. They needed to make sure that the man was really involved in the murder, rather than taking the blame for someone else's crime. 
They spent many hours questioning him about the details of the murder, Atlas confessing that he had planned Pamela's murder in advance. After waiting for her sister to go to work, he went up to their apartment and rang the bell. When Pamela opened the door, he told her there was a leak in one of the pipes in her apartment and urgent repairs needed to be made. Pamela let the man in without a shadow of a doubt. Once in the apartment, he attacked her and strangled her, then took her body back to his apartment and abused her. This was the main motive for what he did. Atlas then placed her in a barrel and took her to the warehouse of the small airport where he worked as a flight instructor. That very day, a few hours after the murder, the man was quietly conducting a few lessons with his students. The barrel stood in the warehouse for several days, after which Atlas took it to the banks of the Missouri River, separated the body and dumped it in the water. In addition, the man told police several facts that were never divulged, so only the killer could know them. With all this information in hand, the detectives had no doubt that Atlas was telling the truth. Fifty-three years later, they finally succeeded in solving the case, though they had to guarantee the murderer full immunity. Remarkably, the murderer decided to accept the deal for a reason. He said that during his imprisonment, he believed in God and began to feel remorse and apologize to Pamela's relatives for what he had done. The Detroit psychologist's analysis turned out to be quite accurate. Atlas really seemed a decent man. For a long time, he had worked as a heavy equipment operator, then he began teaching flight lessons, started a family. Only after the murder of his wife, his true nature became clear. The victim's brother thanked the investigators for bringing the case to an end. The man understood that a conviction and an additional life sentence for Atlas wouldn't have changed anything. And thanks to the detectives, the case was over. Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Thanks for watching.